Welcome to the See What She Can Do collaborative resource between the Paramazing Circle and the Women's Coaches Circle. We, ex we are excited to bring you this special edition, which will include both presentations and later on a panel discussion from key leaders and experts in the industry. We will be discussing how to provide supportive spaces for para-athletes to participate. This includes key tips for clubs that want to start a para-sport program, as well as clubs that have athletes join as an individual. Our first video segment will include presentations by a couple of athletes, some coaches, and they will share their journey and critical tips that will result in success for an athlete, coach, and club. Our first two presenters are Jess Silver and Marin. Jess is a marketing and communications professional specializing in medical and health content, adaptive personal training and fitness consultant, Amazon best-selling author and founder of a nonprofit organization, Flex for Access. She will speak to her learnings from her sport and fitness journey and what to do and not to do as a coach. Marin is a strength and conditioning specialist and coach in Europe and North America and proven martial artist. He has had the extreme privilege of developing functional and strength conditioning programs for track athletes, many mixed martial artists and strength athletes. He has worked with a wide variety of athletes and clients ranging from children as young as 12 years old to having done athletic assessments, scouting, and assisted in preparation for fighters and professional basketball players. So I'm so excited to have both Jess and Marin join us here today. I'm going to be asking each of them a couple of questions that they're going to address specific to their journey in sport and fitness. So Jess, we're gonna start with you. Can you share with us some keys to your success in your sport and fitness journey? I would be glad to. Uh, I would be glad to, thank you for the introduction. And Marin, thank you so much for being here today. You've been an instrumental part or you've been the reason why I've embarked on this fitness journey. Um, so some of the keys to my success have been um, in addressing the importance of community and the community that I was blessed to become a part of when I embarked on my fitness journey. Uh, defying doubters and naysayers who I've had to face throughout my entire life and seeing beyond my limitations. So the limitations that I have faced throughout my life have been subject to my diagnosis of cerebral palsy from birth. When I was born, I was born at two pounds and I was born three months premature and I sustained a brain injury due to a lack of oxygen that came to my brain resulting in cerebral palsy and doctors uh, did not expect me to survive because I was so small and I came so early. And they also had little expectations about what I would be able to do as an individual and never mind even physically. Um, fast forward, uh, well, really since I was a child, the importance of community and the importance of being outgoing has been um, supremely important to me. And it only grew in its importance um, over the last nine and a half, 10 years when I started training at a gym called Pure Motivation Fitness. And I met one of the most phenomenal human beings that I'm proud to call friend and a coach of mine. Um, Marin is on the line today, along with my former trainer, Daniel, um, and the whole team at PMF that really reaffirmed to me that regardless of any limitations, we are stronger and empowered by the community that we surround ourselves with. Um, and when we sort of forget about the limitations that are projected onto us by those who doubt us, we become stronger and we seek avenues for increasing potentials and being able to see beyond limitations. Flex for Access um, has been an endeavor of mine for the last six and a half years, and it's been a nonprofit organization for the last four years, um, which focuses on the importance of adaptive fitness promotion and sport in mainstream settings. And it has been so inspired by my own personal fitness journey um, and realizing that as someone with cerebral palsy, um, you're not really expected to be in a gym in a high performance fitness setting. 
because I use a wheelchair for mobility and I require the assistance of other individuals uh, to move around. And so I'll never forget one of the first days when I walked into PMF and uh, I looked at the pull-up bar. And at first I was a little bit, um, thought maybe that I was a li little bit intimidated because there were some seriously strong guys that were training at the gym and they for sure thought, what is this girl who's not even a hundred pounds capable of doing in a gym? What is she, what is she doing here? And uh, thanks to really the owner and uh, Dimitri Jinkoulis and the amazing team that Marin was a part of for, for so many years, um, I never, well, those of you who know me, um, and Marin knows me well, uh, knows that I never allow anything to get in my way. Um, so if I have a goal in mind, I just go towards that goal. Um, and anybody can try to dissuade me from it, and I will still go forth. And I'm incredibly stubborn um, and chase after that goal. And when I walked into PMF, one of the first things I saw when I saw the pull-up bar and I saw the squat rack, um, I was like, okay. I'm going to go in and do pull-ups. And I rhymed off probably 20 pull-ups with, with Dan uh, when I started training at the gym. And I think lots of guys' jaw dro jaws dropped because they realized um, who, who was in the gym. And in fact, if you have limitations, it's all about circumventing those limitations and educating others that regardless of what our limitations are, I would say the bigger the limitation, the more there is possible because it strengthens your mentality to have to chase after goals and be creative in order to in order to get stronger. And that goes for everything in life, not just my fitness journey. And with Flex for Access, creating the nonprofit organization, um, really I'm driven by this constant desire to go against the grain in the way that people define fitness, um, they see access to fitness, and to create opportunities for anybody, regardless of what their physical limitations are, to be able to train in mainstream settings. And the organization has a global... ...participated in Australia using the hashtag, and also the importance that's increasing over the pandemic has been on education and, and program development. And over the last uh, um, year and a half, I, since getting my training certification as an adaptive personal trainer, um, have put more of an emphasis on uh, devising programming and what that's like actually in mainstream settings for adaptive uh, athletes. And that's what I do in my work as an adaptive personal trainer. And I'm so excited to welcome my friend and coach who I treasure with all of my heart and beyond, um, Marin, to share a bit of his uh, learnings uh, as well and approach to his uh, coaching and, and provide some examples. And then I will speak a bit further. Excellent, Marin. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Can you talk a bit about um, your learning journey and provide a couple of your keys to being successful as a coach. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It's my pleasure to uh, help Jess out and kind of get the information that uh, me and her are pretty engulfed in, in our own training and everything that we've achieved so far. So basically out of everything that my company does, uh, one of my or two of my main passions would be a uh, physical education of adolescents and adaptive fitness. That's basically how me and Jess met and started our journey in the first place. Uh, maybe it's easiest to start with my definition of an athlete. How I see an athlete, it's a person who has the right attitude to achieve higher goals and the right mental fitness to start progressing in their fitness journey. It can be anybody. And uh, Jess is, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate, guys. You have no idea to experience the kind of fortitude that Jess has and see the improvements that we got to through dedication and persistence and adding very good habits to improve her, her quality of life. Uh, as far as my uh, kind of... 
uh, definition of coaching goes and what I do is I believe that not enough coaches and not enough adopted clients even are aware of the possibilities that they have to improve their quality of life just by doing a little bit of, of, of that of fitness, basically experiencing fitness in their life. Uh, the main issue is that uh, adaptive athletes have an extreme will to improve, but unfortunately there's not enough qualified professionals or there are qualified professionals, but they do not want to take on the challenge. So the people that really want to train from that community don't have the possibility like Jess has and a few of my other executive clients that are in the same position as Jess to express that joy of physical movement. Uh, they are not limited in any way to a normal person, in my opinion. It's all about scaling down and putting those athletes and clients in the right positions to get better in general with their movement and their, their nervous system control and everything else. So what we do is we incorporate all the elements possible that we can from electromuscular stimulation to meditation to deloaded movements in positions where the athlete can execute them to improve every aspect of fitness, just like a normal athlete. Everything from explosive power to motor control to endurance to strength and conditioning, everything can be done if there is a will to take this on. So my company really wants to help Flex for Access in general as a company who's trying to make a difference in this aspect of fitness to bring this to light more and get more coaches involved to help as many people, adaptive athletes as we can, to get to where Jess is, is getting and where Jess still is planning to go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so back to you, Jess. Can you touch on, I apologize, a little background noise there. Can you touch on some practical steps and initiatives um, that you've put in place um, that you think are really important for any club or coach to be aware of as they move forward to potentially work with para-athletes? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And uh, I'll just go off of Mayor's uh, points there um, in saying that really the problem that we endeavor to address or that we are addressing every single day, not that we hope to address, that we are addressing every single day is this idea that if you're an adaptive athlete, you have so many limitations, you're, you're never going to be able to practice at that elite level or, you know, be active and improve upon your condition. So what I would say the practical steps and initiatives that I've taken is towards educating mainstream coaches along with with Marin helping me do that to educate mainstream coaches on um, the the progressions or regressions that athletes like myself and like Jess Lewis, who's on this call, um, need to go through in order to um, in order to train and in order to excel in their in their training, but further to their quality of life. So what I've always found is that um, communication is is supremely important, and I would say most important to have to communicate what our limitations are, what our goals are, what we're looking to achieve and what we're struggling with. And for professionals not to be limited by looking at what they see, in my case or in Jess's case, if they see the chair, they may get intimidated and think, oh, you know, as Mar Marion would say, you know, we joke about me being too fragile. So like, you know, a coach might be too scared of, of training with me. And, and He'll, he'll be the first to tell you that the first thing you got to do is not be afraid. You got to just um, trust your coaching, trust your process, um, and incorporate assessment tools. So um, there's something called a functional movement screening, for example, that's a very useful assessment tool to actually um, incorporate in order to test athletes' ranges of motion, for example. Um, other questionnaires that I incorporate as part of Flex for Access's work are looking at quality of life questionnaires. So what has an athlete's previous exposure been to uh, to fitness and to other methods of training? What are they comfortable with? And understand that the body and the mind are always working together. Um, and that has been reaffirmed to me in my friendship and in working together with Mare more than 
than it ever has. Um, if before I understood that, you know, having a strong mind meant going against whatever anybody was going to project in their belief of what I could or couldn't do. Now I actually um, incorporate visualization and meditation and uh, like sports specific visualization techniques with Aaron and with other uh, individuals that I work with to talk about how, in fact, if you strengthen the mind and if you approach it from first the psychological um, standpoint, then moving towards the body, which I also did with Dan all the time whenever we were in training, we would he would first get me to visualize what it was I was trying to do and scale the movement back. That That is most important. Um, and really, my journey um, about learning as I embarked on this fitness journey was to really realize that people are going to be afraid of working with me because they're going to be intimidated or afraid of hurting me as I, you know, engage in physical activity. And I kind of had to tell everybody, yeah, just throw that out the window. You can pretty much, we can pretty much do anything we need to do in order to get me to um, improve. And I know that whenever I meditate or whenever I engage in any kind of training with uh, Marin, um, and when I was at the gym as well, I basically would approach my training as such that I knew that like a professional athlete, I had a job to do, except that my job is not, um, you know, a season or a contest of, of playoffs that where we're trying to win a championship where a team is trying to win a championship. My championship that I'm going after is a life championship. Um, and what I try to do with uh, all of my work with Flex for Access is to help people to understand that. We are not just facilitating opportunities for adaptive athletes who are who exist on the fringe, who are so different from the mainstream athlete. Um, what I always say is that it's not only is it so important for athletes like myself and Jess, um, because it's given us so much in our lives. For me, it actually gave me a career, um, a career focus now because of all the work I do with Flex for Access. Um, and as an adaptive athlete, because of of Dan, um, who was my former former trainer, and because of Marin, I had this passion instilled in me that I don't think anybody could ever extrapolate out of me now. Um, but uh, what I would say is that it's not just important for us; it's important for mainstream coaches who really want to be in the industry and are really in it for the right reasons. Why? Because it actually makes them a stronger coach in realizing how they can not only make their club accessible from an infrastructural standpoint, that's important, yes, but most importantly, it's important to scale um, the program in accordance to each individual's uh, limitations, but also realize that in doing that and in challenging your athlete, you're actually challenging yourself as a coach to be a stronger um, better, more empowered coach that's actually changing lives of individuals. It's not just a day job, which I'm sure Mary will attest to. Great. And Marin, can you share with us a, a couple of practical steps that you've implemented that you think um, are the most important things a coach should take away um, as they prepare to work with para-athletes? Absolutely. So basically the quality of human movement and, and good health and fitness can only be achieved by labor, by constantly working on small steps to build something bigger. So as Jess can attest to what we're doing is, we incorporate a lot of not too invasive uh, modalities to get her nervous system to respond to the physical movements that we uh, start working on. So for example, our sessions always start with uh, either electromuscular stimulation or a nice deep meditation where she gets her nervous system ready for what's about to happen. So all the stress from the day because of her spasticity and how adaptive athletes usually, especially with spinal cord and, and brain injuries, uh, their nervous system is what dictates the quality of the movement they can express that day. So what we try to do with the modalities that we use in our training is calm that nervous system down, get them back to that parasympathetic rest and relax state where they can express the athletic expression of that movement or whatever's planned for that session. So I think that that is the main 
point that I would like to teach more coaches that it's not about trying to force the movement and getting frustrated when an athlete cannot do it. There is a reason why they can't do it. And there is something that you can do by using these different modalities to facilitate that quality that you request from your athlete. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marin. And thank you very much, Jess and Marin. We really appreciate you sharing with us um, so much critical information that clubs and coaches can take away um, about your um, athlete coach training relationship that you have. And, and it's been really valuable. So I appreciate your time. And uh, we're going to turn now. We have um, Jess Lewis um, here. She's a three-time Paralympian um, in para-athletics, a motivational speaker, and a certified therapeutic recreation specialist. Um, she has been competing internationally, representing Bermuda for the past 11 years. Jess is going to share with us some key learnings from her journey in sport um, that have resulted in um, a positive and successful athletic career. So Jess, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Erin. And I'm so excited to be here and to have this cross event between the Paramazing Circle and the Women's Coaches Circle. Um, so, uh, like Erin said, I've been competing in para-athletics for the past uh, 11 years, um, and um, these are kind of just what I've found has been really helpful uh, towards my journey and my training. Um, so my first one is about setting big goals, but being a little bit realistic about them as well. Um, so for me, uh, I compete in the 100, 400, and 800 meter races, um, but due to my size, um, as well as kind of a few of the limitations that I have with my disability, um, I know that I will never be super competitive in the 800 meter, um, just because I don't have, you know, the body mass to um, put on a lot of strength and power that would help me uh, through the endurance of that race. Um, so you know, I kind of gear my training a little bit more towards um, being uh, on the sprint side. So working on my 100 and 400 meter where, um, you know, can get fast and powerful off the start um, and, and you can kind of stop. Um, it's what I always say is, is really great. Um, there is something to be said about, um, you know, training the body and, and finding areas that you can improve on, but it also is about being realistic on what actually can be achieved. Um, so you do want to push yourself, but also being, um, you know, a little bit mindful of, of what your body is saying that day um, as well. And I think when you set those goals and are realistic about it, it can help you to stay determined. It can help you to continue having a positive mindset. Um, you know, my previous coach, uh, Ken Tom, who unfortunately passed away in 2017, um, was really big on this about, you know, being real realistic, but still setting out, you know, those goals that you wanted to achieve um, and kind of working out the best plan to, to get there. Um, another one of my points um, is about being flexible with the training plan. Um, and by this, I mean that, um, you know, para-athletes um, have uh, such a wide range of disabilities and every single day that disability is going to impact them differently on a physical level. So, uh, for example, there might be days where you have a lot more pain than others, um, as well as some disabilities are affected by the weather. Um, so they might not be able to perform um, like they uh, can on another day if, if the weather is a little bit different. Um, so from my experience, um, I had a back surgery in 2011 as I was training to hopefully qualify for the 2012 London Paralympic Games. And it was a very minor surgery. Um, I was actually awake for it. Um, but it actually it uh, resulted in a lot of uh, nerve pain um, and it kind of just set all my nerves um, off in my back. Um, so I was, you know, dealing with pain on a scale of one to ten, you know, ten every single day. Um, so I had to really adjust uh, my training plan to fit into that so that I could go and maybe have, you know, more recovery days um, as well as to fit in different treatments. Um, like massage therapy or physiotherapy. Um, and these are all things that really need to be taken into consideration 
uh, when working with an athlete with a disability. Um, but it's also about finding different strategies or uh, ways that you can kind of push through the days that are tougher as well. Um, because, you know, in order to get stronger and better, you have to kind of push yourself behind, uh, beyond those limits. Um, and as my previous coach, uh, Ken, always used to say is, you know, on race day, um, you could be not feeling 100%, but you still have to go out and, and perform. Um, so it's also about, you know, setting out that plan if if things aren't uh, looking 100% on that day. Um, my last point is about the power of mentorship. Um, so I was introduced, I'm actually originally from Bermuda, um, and I was introduced to an organization called Windreach, uh, which provides programs for people with disabilities. Um, and that really gave me a space to, you know, meet other people like me that had disabilities that were going through similar challenges. Um, and it really gave me a space where I could, you know, be comfortable having a disability and, you know, learning not necessarily just about parasport, but just every day-to-day uh, -day activities and, you know, how to be um, a strong and capable person. Um, and through that, having, you know, those mentors there was just so extremely powerful in helping me realize, you know, what I could accomplish. Um, and I have that as well with my incredible team uh, that I work with in Canada, uh, Coach Curtis, Coach Lisa, my teammates, Austin, Nan, and Isaiah who all just, you know, motivate me every single day to continue working hard and going after those big, crazy dreams that we all have. Um, so um, for like a specific dedicated program um, for para-athletes, uh, you know, the mentorship there is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then it can also still uh, be a huge part of an integrated program um, where it might not have, you know, this similar um, teachings uh, when you're with a, a person with a disability and another person with a disability. But if you have in those integrated programs, there's still a lot of um, kind of mental preparation and, and um, uh, ways to, to train um, that I think would be really beneficial that you could talk with, you know, an able body and a person with a disability. Um, and it would also be, you know, a fantastic way to bring in that athlete um, and help them feel, you know, more comfortable and that they're in a safe space um, in order to compete and and meet new friendship or make new friendships. Um, and mentorship also goes just beyond, you know, athlete to athlete. Um, it can also be coach to coach. Um, so for me, uh, when I first started competing in 2010, I was still in Bermuda in high school. Um, so um, I actually was working with a coach that um, coached able-bodied runners, and that coach would work with Ken in Canada. Um, so having that kind of relationship where, you know, the coach learned uh, more things about parasport as well as, um, you know, having that opportunity to further his credentials and, and um, you know, provide a, a amazing opportunity uh, for me to continue training while I was still home. Um, so yeah, those are what I found to be really successful to help me in my journey. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica Lewis. I really appreciate all your feedback. Um, now, before we finish up this video segment, I do want to um, go back and ask Jess Silver and Marin a, a bit about, I guess, sort of as some closing remarks, what would you say is one thing that you would recommend to do and not to do um, as um, suggestions for um, any club or coach as they move forward as par as sort of rounding up our, our segment here. If you don't mind, maybe Jess Silver, you can start off. Yeah, so I'd be glad to. Um, I'll start with the do not. Um, and I, I was going to go off of Jess's point here. So this is so fitting. Um, what I would say for coaches um, and trainers that are maybe coming into the field of kinesiology or sports management, not to do when you're working with an adaptive, uh, the adaptive population is not to talk down to the athlete and not to see the disability as the all defining factor. Like, oh, you know, Jess Silver came into the gym. Now I need to just pay attention to the fact that 
she's in a wheelchair. She doesn't, you know, walk the same way or run the same way as my, as the other members do in the gym. So I need to almost like patronize her and make her feel lesser because of her disability and start programming from that standpoint. So I found that whenever coaches or physiotherapists ever told me, they ever started the dialogue by saying, Jess, you're not going to be able to do this. You know, if I said um, that my goal was, for example, to transfer from from my chair to another chair, um, what I found a lot of professionals would do previous to working with Dan and working with Marin in the gym is they would focus solely on that goal. And they would say, if in five weeks, you're not going to get to to doing that, you're not going to be able to do it. And there's no point even even trying. So I would say if you focus on one goal and focus strictly on the limitations, um, that's a big do not and do not talk down to the athlete. Um, What I would say is most important is to ask the athlete what their goals are. Talk to us as the human beings that we are, not as individuals who are different because of our more visible disabilities. And for some individuals, they may not be as visible. Um, and, And don't make us feel like we're fragile because of whatever the limitations um, are that we're facing. Um, and what I would say is, is key is to scale down, as Mayor um, mentioned uh, previously, scale down and modify the exercise um, in almost like compartmentalizing a task. So if, I don't know, if we're, you know, trying to reach a really big year-end goal, um, you know, break it down into smaller parts. So if I'm learning how to squat, one of the very first things I'll never forget Marin saying um, when he was still working at the gym was split the floor, um, you know, visualize splitting the floor, um, you know, set your feet apart. And that's your first step to getting into a squat position, then work on the range of motion in your knees. So breaking down the goal into more um, easily understood components uh, is, is key. And then obviously, you know, having the right equipment or modifying according to an athlete's size or how they're feeling on the particular day, as Jess was mentioning in your journey, I can attest to that 1,000 or 10,000 percent that, you know, uh, how we feel one day is not how we may feel the next. For example, right now I'm dealing with a knee injury. And if it wasn't for Marin right now, who is helping to rehab that, um, I don't know where I would be. But, you know, having him continually saying that, you know, we're still going to get you to be able to squat. We're still going to get you to be able to work on eventually deadlifting, which is a goal of mine. Um, you know, compartmentalizing those goals is most important. And not saying um, that, you know, you can't train an athlete with um, varying needs because you're not qualified. I would say right away saying you're not qualified is a big do not too. As a coach, I would say you have to trust yourself um, and you're the reason why you got into the field a little bit more to take a risk in order to work with the adaptive population. And it's not always as easy, but coaches that are in it for the right reasons um, are so great at what they do because they do that. I'll let Marion speak now. So yeah, from my side, I would say two main things that can change Every, any, any coach's perspective on the abilities of an of a athlete in, in Jess's, Jess's situation. Uh, it's basically, disability is not a limitation. That's the number one thing that you should get out of your head as a coach. And the next one is that anything can be achieved if the right steps are taken. And uh, how can I put this? A differently able athlete can execute everything in the same way that a perfectly able one can if the movement is adjusted properly. Um, Anything that I do with my basketball players or my martial artists from the mental game aspect or a physical game aspect can be incorporated into Jess's training in one way or the other. So if it's an aspect of strength and conditioning or aspect of mental visualization of a movement, it can all be done. 
And just as a prime example of somebody with the right mental attitude to improve, that sought out the right professionals that will take on that challenge and that do understand, which is another don't that I would say, do understand the element where you can't take your program or what you program with, with an adaptive athlete as gospel. So I would say focus more on working with how the athlete feels that day and what you can get out of that athlete at the, in that day and, and in the way that their mental state and physical tightness and, and ability goes for, for that particular training session. Those are the basically main points that a coach should focus on and believe in yourself, believe in your skill and understand that everything that you learn through your experience as a coach can be used with an adaptive athlete if the right steps are taken and the right approach, your mental approach and the athlete's mental approach is on the same, same page. And any goal can be achieved, as Jess can, can attest. Small steps, but with adaptive athletes, those small steps add up to be really, really big gains and really, really big improvements in their overall quality of life. So I would, I, I hope more coaches get involved and I'll, I'll help in any way that I can. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jess, Jess and Marin. Um, all fantastic um, tips, um, suggestions, and I really appreciate you sharing your journey, um, which can only help others in their journey um, to be successful as we um, work to provide more supportive spaces um, for para-athletes to participate. Um, so if you have not had a chance yet, um, be sure to check out our second video, um, which includes Jessica Lewis and her two coaches in their journey, talking about their relationship and how they're successful in working together. So be sure to check that out as well. And um, thank you again to everybody for joining us today. Have a great day.